a unique design. Why didn't that move forward? That would have not have been a complicated thing to do. Uh, some of those parts ended up on the 2180. Yeah. Oh, they did? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but you had that cylinder there. Yeah, I had the double cylinder from 2150. Mm -hmm. And 2150 was set up for that mounting, that frame that they used the purple tractor, or the later tractors on the 180, uh, was basically the same frame as what had been on the 2150, Lee, 2255. Lee, Lee Vaughn was the project engineer on the 2180, and, and he was a Minneapolis Moline guy, yes. but that, all his documentation on that we've got here, but he's got basically the history of his projects in the museum, but yeah, he... There's a lot of similarities between that axle on the 20, which was used in the two-wheel drive whites after that, too. You know, the, the 100 series, the 160 used that. Yeah. Okay. But the, the one thing that Agco is still using, that was, was a Minneapolis design, was the taper log taper, house yep. on the rear axle. Wheel centers and, and taper log uh, lock hubs are still the original Moline dimensions from 68. Thank God, because we'd have still been using U-bolts. The U-bolts would stretch and pop. Yeah, 55 And then they also and sheared <laughs> nine bolts, yeah. those smaller bolts. And that, that happened in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And they went in and put three, between Extra. the three, uh, or the nine hole bolt pattern, yeah. there was three odd bigger, ones. three, three yeah. odd ones that were quite a bit bigger so you didn't shear off the, the wheel. That, that vertical, that VTM lay, the vertical tracer lay uh, that, that was at Hopkins, they moved that down here to Charles City and we used that to the last day cutting that, the, the wheel castings, the, the taper and that. And the OD, you know, getting and, a tree. And I, went, I don't know whether it went to cold water or, but anyway, the, wherever they build the big tractors today, they're still using that hub design. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. well, I um, came up here in 82 to a dealer meeting, and they carried us through the plant, went through the foundry, I believe it was in the foundry, and there were some high shelves up there full of parts. And I asked the tour guide what that was, and he said it's the tooling for the can't engine plant yeah. or something like that. Yeah, they had the, see the, the, the foundry here was expanded to cast the, so it could cast the engines blocks for the, for the Canton engine factory and Charles City production, whatever would have been corporate tractor or continuation of the old. And at one time they were going to continue Moline and the A4T longer. And uh, they had to have, they had a big expansion on the foundry here to be able to handle the new corporate engine. And there was castings made, and there's a few of those engines in those picture prototypes were actually machined on that new factory in Canton, Ohio. And it was a state-of-the-art factory. They had a transfer line, they put an engine block in the first machine, and it didn't, wasn't touched or moved, it just transferred itself down come out the other end of the line, 200 foot downstream, completely machined and ready to be assembled. And uh, so it was, it was very, very, yeah. very modern, yeah. but it unfortunately never never got there. Oh, they ran out of money to put it through. I think it was over $15 million spent in the Chelsea plant on that, on the foundry upgrades and then buying machining for the planetary final drives and the white tractor that uh, the, the, the CNC, we used a lot of CNC machining on that. <coughs> but the heat, some of the heat treat furnaces that were in the foundry were never once fired up. Wow. They were fully installed, ready to go, and never ran. You guys had uh, pictures in the news or in the magazine that showed the uh, Lake Street plant and you probably I think it was in the gold brush or maybe it was in the corresponder too but shows a line of uh, flat cars with loaded with tractors 95 and 97 Masseys are the ones you see the most because Moline made them for the then for uh, Massey and they sold them cheaper 
than the Moline <laughs> dealers sold theirs. So, in the same doggone thing as a 705 and a 706, <coughs> except for the round hood and the black and white, or the gray and red and, and white uh, seats, and the and on some of the wheat lands, uh, can you hook up on the rear end? And yet, in that, the, especially in Canada, uh, <clears throat> where a lot of those Masseys went, the guys, that, the farmers, would buy the Masseys, same dog ending as Moline, except they were cheaper. Same thing. And that didn't help Moline at all. I got lots of dealer calls on that. <laughs> I imagine you would have. <laughs> well, uh, there was a couple of years they built a couple thousand. Those uh, 97s yeah. or more for. Oh yeah, uh, I worked at Lake Street then for, for a Massey. few weeks. Yeah, and we were working. The M5s had come out at the same time, and then I'd haul them out to the yard back the plant there to load on the tractors. Mm -hmm. or I'm in, on the flatbeds. Well, you know, Illinois is the horsepower capital of the United States or the world, maybe I don't know, and every. Uh, all the telephone, I was transferred to the, from Kansas City to uh, Peoria in, in the middle 60s. And uh, every other phone call I got, I need, we need more horsepower, we need more horsepower. Well, we had a change in the top management and Cummins, Cummings mm -hmm. became the president of, of Minneapolis Moline. And, and uh, he was kind of a speed guy, he liked mm -hmm. that. And the dealers got to him, and so he <coughs> took an 800 engine and sent it someplace and had every piece in it that moved balanced. And they sent it back and we put it in a G1000, wasn't it? Probably. Yeah, a G1000. And uh, you were there and they rep we had certain people there, and I was happy to be one of them, and I'm sure you were there. And uh, so they started up this thing they had uh, with this new engine in there, and they got up to 2,000 RPM and went to 2,500 RPM and 3,000 RPM, and half the people scattered. <laughs> <laughs> and they got it up to 3,600 RPM. And I guess you and I were the only ones left. <laughs> <laughs> and that thing just, and we put that in a, a 1050, wasn't it? And I'm not sure. Now. Well, they put it in a, and, and you know, Mo, or, um, Illinois was tractor pulled crazy. And so they, what was it? I forget whose tractor they were. And, and we went to St. Louis, I think it was, for the big national tractor pull. And we had this tractor, and I, don't, I can't think of the name of the guy that the tractor was, and he ran, man, he went right out the door. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and whatever happened to that engine, do you know? I, I do not know. Man, I think it's probably an Illinois case. An 800, <laughs> an 800 power unit running 3,600 RPM. <laughs> 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 so it just did that on one. It, it was just as smooth. That on one. <laughs> one engine. That, that was that. Yeah, this was before they. They built them with a small bell, mm -hmm. so they'd bolt right in. Somebody got a speeding ticket with one of those hot tracks. Well, <laughs> I thought I was getting a speeding ticket. <laughs> <laughs> I got <laughs> stopped. <laughs> Tell that story. That's a good one. Uh, in 70, well, after we'd been to Illinois that summer, and we, we went to a tractor pool mm -hmm. together, together. He took me and Alan Wells to a tractor pool in Peoria or somewhere in there. And it didn't have any A4Ps, they had an A4T pull-off, pull or back pull, pulled the sled back tractor. But they had several Moines there that were very strong. And after we got back to Hopkins, I went to Cummins and suggested that, how about the company putting a little money in sponsoring uh, a tractor? And we volunteered, there was enough engineering help to do it after hours on their own time if the company had put up a little bit of money. And so, uh, I don't know who the sales man, the, oh. Charlie DeClerc, wasn't it? Oh, uh, it was, uh, 
the he was in Minneapolis at the time. Ernie Simmons. He'd oh, been yeah. a, he, oh, he went out and sold this the guy that had been running G1000s in tractor pulls in Minnesota and doing pretty good with them. And he sold him a new 1050. And we got it, uh, took that 1050 and took the engine part. Uh, I don't think we did try, to, we did balance some parts. It was still a 504. Uh, we hung a turbocharger from an 855 Cummins engine on top that stuck up through the hood. It was a three speed and uh, we put 24.5, 32, or no, 30.5, 32s on the back. Oh, it pulled a few times and we didn't think it was tuned in quite right, so we brought it back to, to Hopkins that one week. And we wanted to test it on the dyno and we didn't have anything to Hopkins big enough. So we took it down to Lake Street plant where the G2 lab was and where they had dynamometers that could handle that kind of power. And we took it down a Friday afternoon ahead of a traffic rush and kind of went through back streets because Lake Street, there was a, always a lot of traffic and you didn't want to be holding, holding them up the track. We want to make people mad. So drove it down there in the afternoon and we tested that night and you mentioned you went 35. With 504, we went to 4,000 and decided that was enough. Because <laughs> we thought the PTO shaft was going to go fly apart. It wasn't the, wasn't the engine. Well, uh, it was like 9 o'clock when we got done and I wanted to get back to Hopkins. And so I started driving from Lake Street or plant out back out to Hopkins, which was on Lake Street, yeah. right on Lake Street. And that was the local <coughs> dive or round the block for all, you know, every small town had a, you had a, a loop you did that all the kids were out cruising in their cars, had to look just so and pump the gas at the stop sign and try to try to drag race across the intersection without getting a ticket type of thing. and. Anyway, they were coming up beside me and all giving the thumbs up and, and you know, let her go. <laughs> so, uh, I went along there and I, I had it in high, high gear, fifth gear, and I had low, uh, amp, or low range amplifier with a three speed. And it had enough power with that turbo that even at idle, you know, it took off and you just take off and then jam it up to the two gears all the way to high gear full throttle, and you could get across the intersection about as fast as a car. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then I'd back off. That's how you get it. <laughs> and then pretty soon I noticed that there wasn't all this traffic coming around me anymore. And I looked back and there was a couple cars following me that were unmarked, you know, just cars. But I couldn't figure out why they were staying behind me because they uh, didn't, all the other cars had been going around me. And got out there almost, uh, uh, was it Lake Harriet? Yeah. Out there on the west. Yeah, we wouldn't be Lake Calhoun. Yeah, yeah, we're in there. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, I look up, and here's a red light in the car behind me, and it's a dash, and two regular police cars coming in from both sides. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one setting across them, and coming at me from the other way. <laughs> and I was sure that they had gotten me for speeding. <laughs> Because it would run over 30 miles an hour. That'd be but, something if they ever, first time you ever ticketed a tractor. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, what had happened, I guess, when we took the tractor away from Lake Street that night, some lady that lived in the area had seen this tractor go out and a young guy driving it and figured there was someone was stealing a tractor <laughs> and called the police. <laughs> so a man never Johnny on the spot and they said, I have had me. Wait, I had. A bunch of the engineers that worked with me were in the car behind me, and we got stopped and got showed them our IDs and so forth, and, and they <laughs> let us go. Yeah. <laughs> it's the only time I've ever been stopped on a tractor. <laughs> I've been stopped with car more than once. <laughs> Mike, do you remember what horsepower was pulled with that thing? Uh, we never uh, went full bore on it. I think we backed off at somewhere around 450. Yeah. The ones in Illinois that we had copied uh, Chenoweth or Quick, yeah. I think we're talking, uh, they thought they had over 600 yeah, I from remember a 504. That, you know, and, and, and when you had that on a dyno, Al Wells was standing by the engine and there was this explosion. Mm -hmm. 
and something hit him in the back, and he thought it was over. I don't know if you remember that, but it just a hose that was blown. Didn't you air, have a pressurized hose or something? system there or something? Well, they had you had to pump water through the dynamometer. Okay. And it was pumping so fast that it, <laughs> dynamometer wasn't designed for 3,500. <laughs> <laughs> what was the last year they made tractors at the Lakeville plant, Lake Street plant? 72. 72. Was it December 23rd? Was it or somewhere there? Uh, well, my information said it was in May. That's what I was going to say. Early was May. Spring. They weren't all straight out. It was a 950. And they built in like the first or second week of May. But then they shipped A4Ts down here to be distributed. They, they had tried to build a stockpile, knowing that they weren't going to have a four wheel drive tractor for a couple of years. And so there was a bunch of them shipped down here. Some of them didn't even have paint on, or just primer. So they could paint them either red or yellow or red or green. Green. Oh, yeah. And uh, that, that, some of that shipping didn't get finished, I don't think, until in the fall. Until the fall. Or in fall of 72. I had spoke with John Oliver. They are shipping down here. I, they shipped them out through, um, I'm thinking it was well into 73. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't know what date, but it was pretty. It was quite a while there that they did. But right at the end, then they ran out. <coughs> I had spoke with Don Oliver. Of course, the people I know that he was instrumental with the Stuttgart tractor, which trans. And I want to say he told me he took the last A4Ts that were in stock. It was like a dozen. They were shipped to his dealership. In Stuttgart, and some of them were 2655s. Um, just by accident, I found that. Yeah. that I've seen some advertised down there mm -hmm. in Arkansas. So. Yeah. He sold a lot of four wheel drives. Mike, do you know if there's any plans to make a working model of the Parker tractor? Well, we want to. The, we got the chassis, we've got the rear end, we've got an engine. Uh, we don't have sheet metal or platform. We got a cab, and the intent was eventually to get it us back in running form. Uh, it shouldn't work so we, much we need time. more people to <laughs> shouldn't work so much that are around here to, to be able to work on it. Yeah, we and thought which, that was pretty uh, hilarious. Uh, my health is deteriorated, and Wayne doesn't live here, so we don't, uh, Keith Bauer did a lot of the work on what's there now, and. Uh, Hopefully, that's still the long-term goal: is to get get a running corporate tractor. Mike, Mike, okay. tell them tell them the story behind that cab, where you found it, and what the cab? Yeah, how you got it on another tractor? And oh, the cab the, it was it was a new it was pod cab that was designed and took bids from three or four cab companies. I don't remember how many. And I think more than one cab company built a, a prototype of the cab that we we're going to use on some of those prototype tractors. Uh, when they were scrapping out, uh, they had an extra cab left that never got put on a tractor in Hopkins in engineering. And I still visited with Alan and Mark Sickman on a regular basis, even after I went back to the farm. And they said they were going to, uh, it was going to get scrapped out. And I had a G1000 that I had made to look like a white, white or white style, like a 2150. And I, I made a deal to buy the cab, and I came up here and put it in the back of my truck and took it home, and I got it on, a, on my G1000 and farmed with it for up through 70, 70, or no, 80, 81, somewhere in there. And, and I sold it to my uh, brother. And he quit farming and tractor got sold at an auction. I didn't know what had happened to it. Well, I went to this uh, guy at, uh, by uh, just north of Newton, not far from Dick Allen, that kind of had collected tractors. He got a lot of them out of Colfax. And where there was this white tractor advertised, a G1000 white, which I'm saying, what's that? There was never a G1000 white. Well, I got there that day and I was, when I was walking up, I could just see the back of the cab and it was silver. And I said, that cab shape is familiar. And sure enough, it was my old tractor. 
There's a lot of ways you could recognize it. And I got it bought back then. And I stripped it down. Yeah, I still got the G1000 in parts because it had ticked all the platform controls. I'd redone all the controls, <laughs> moved the plat one forward and up. And uh, But anyway, the, the cab is sitting out here. And hopefully we're going to someday get that whole thing yeah. put back together. There was one, <clears throat> one of the larger corporate tractors left out there by the fence for a long time. Oh. Uh, in Hopkins. And one Wallace. ended up at the test track in Charles City. Yeah, one was out the test track, I know. My, and that was used as a load tractor. Mm -hmm. That's well, That one that was sitting by the fence, that might be where it disappeared to then. And then it was, uh, was, it was sold off. The auction? It was sold at the auction. A dealer in Nebraska bought it to get the engine for it. Put it in a 2135. It was sold at an auction in, oh, when the WFE or that Texas yeah. or Tech or. George Gonzalez said, uh, uh, Texas Consolidated Industries? Yeah, or something like that. I think they had an auction cleaning up a lot of stuff. And the dealer out there, he bought a lot of stuff. And he was that kind of, he dealer built in volume at Valparaiso. And I found the, the uh, rear end out there when I was looking for any parts uh, back in, oh, it was 92, three, four, somewhere in that time frame. And they wanted to know if he'd sell it. And yeah, he'd sell it, because I, re I recognized it then after I, well, I was walking up there and the weeds were about over the top of the final drive, didn't have any wheels on it. And I'm saying, some of that, hey, that looks familiar, that transmission housing. There wasn't, that's, that's unique. And I got to flip it and re recognize it as, a, as a, one of the corporate tractors. Because I, I had worked on the corporate tractor in 1970 for oh, almost a year, I guess, starting in late 69, most of the year of 1970, worked on the corporate tractor. Well, why didn't they put more mains in them molding motors? <laughs> Tradition, they could have. <coughs> they, uh, uh, it would have taken quite a bit of tooling revision to do it. Uh, they basically they didn't break down my cranks. They had so much meat in it, they could get away with it. And uh, there was quite a few of the other companies that built diesel engines with four mains until they really started turbocharging, and that's when they they really I, start going to the. I think a do eight. 282 International is a four main engine, which yeah. is your 560, 656 motor. Yes. How about 585? It was four main. Four four main. main. Well, I don't know if you've ever picked up, tried to pick up one of those cranks. Three men. I'm no three men. It's uh, bearings, the rod bearings are three and a half inches diameter. The Cummins 855 are three and an eighth for comparison. And, and, the, and the crank bearing, the Main crank bearings are three and a half also. Actually, they probably would have had a better engine with smaller bearings because trying to run a 2400, the oil shears at that high speed and got hot, and that's why they had to have the oil cooler on the side. But uh, there was so much mass running up and down. 585 would have had a lot better engine if they kept 2000 RPM, we ran which it was originally years. designed for. Yeah. Now, I had one old mechanic tell me if he didn't need that outside oil pump, if you just ran an oil line right to that gear on the cam and then sprayed oil on that. Would that have kept it from going out? Or? Well, they, you could for the camshaft, but the basic pump you put on the outside 